are two things we all want to say today. We want to say, first, we don't want a carbon tax. And second, we do want an election. Get so wet! Get so wet! Get so wet! Putting a price on carbon, the issue that has cast a long and conflicted shadow over Australian politics. Welcome to the program. There are several issues dogging the Gillard government at present, but none is more divisive than the current debate over climate change and how to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Australia is one of the highest emitters of greenhouse gas pollution per head of population in the world, but we are still deeply divided over how to deal with it. With two previous attempts to establish an emissions trading scheme, one sponsored by John Howard, the other by Kevin Rudd, now consigned to the political dustbin, the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, last week introduced a bill that will put at least a short-term price on carbon emissions for businesses across Australia. The opposition leader, Tony Abbott, has described it as the longest suicide note in history and is stoking a people's revolt against the carbon tax. This is an issue that keeps taking political scalps. Arguably, it was John Howard's reluctance to embrace a strong climate change policy that helped cost him the 2007 election. Malcolm Turnbull lost his job to Tony Abbott because he supported Kevin Rudd's plan to put a price on carbon. When Kevin Rudd abandoned his plan for an ETS, it spelt the beginning of the end for his prime ministership. Now Julia Gillard and Labor have slumped perilously in the polls and her opponents smell blood. Marion Wilkinson investigates the battle lines in Australia's climate war. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much for coming. Good. Good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you. That's wonderful. Good morning. How are you? Election now. Welcome aboard, my Good morning. No carbon tax. No carbon tax. You're right about that. Thank Thank you, sir. It's dawn in suburban Sydney, and a newly activated political army is mobilising for an assault on Canberra. Good morning, folks. Uh, Welcome aboard. No Carbon Tax Express to Canberra. These self-styled rebels have answered the rallying cry to join a people's revolt against the carbon tax and the Prime Minister they call Julia. (laughs) Julia, because she lied. She said we will not have carbon tax uh, if she's elected. And what does she do? She's having carbon tax. She hasn't given us a chance to vote for it. I voted for uh, One Nation in the Senate once when Pauline Hanson first started her movement. The vast majority of scientists believe that it's a lot of poppycock, that it's a natural change that's taking place all the time, due to nature. I have to admit that I'm a 2GB listener, (laughs) an avid 2GB listener. G'day, g'day. We are broadcasting from the nation's capital today where I would estimate about 6,500 people have gathered to have their say over the carbon dioxide tax they are calling... Galvanised by talkback radio, an angry blogosphere, climate sceptics and a fear for their future, the rebels gathered in front of Parliament House last month demanding a new election. Swelling the numbers were old One Nation campaigners and far-right conspiracy theorists. But at its core, this revolt is driven in no small part by Liberal Party activists. They're surfing the anger of small business owners, retirees and many hard-pressed pensioners. 
and they believe these rebels will deliver a thumping victory to Tony Abbott if they can force an early election. There are two things we all want to say today. We want to say, first, we don't want a carbon tax. And second, we do want an election. This is the statement which has reverberated around this country and will continue to reverberate around this country. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. It's a witch! 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 There is no doubt the divisive debate over the carbon tax and climate change is radicalising Australian politics. The debate has been marred by abuse and even death threats, and it is rattling the Prime Minister and her minority government. Well, I don't tend to talk publicly about uh, matters involving myself and my security, but I will say some things about the public debate. I think there has been a different tempo to the public debate of late. I don't believe we're the only nation in the world that is seeing its public debate change. Uh, in America, we've seen it changed with Tea Party style tactics, and I think some of that has been imported to this country. Marianne, I think there is a lack of civility on both sides of this debate. Uh, I don't think it's at all fair to say that it's only one side uh, which is hot under the collar here. Uh, I think that people should be civil. I think that if anyone uh, is receiving death threats, uh, they should take that to the police and the police should deal with it. Uh, but the point I make is that when you've got a Prime Minister who says one thing before the election, does the opposite after the election, you can understand why people feel ripped off. I think the whole thing is really most unfortunate for our democracy, how it's been hyped up, the call for the people's revolt, uh, the sorts of fringe extreme political elements that have re-emerged uh, into the political environment. And really, Tony Abbott has encouraged all of that. And I think it's a pretty unfortunate thing. And what, again, is it about at the end of the day? It's about his quest to become Prime Minister. There are many rebel organisers keen to bring down the Gillard government, but there are a small number who are also skilled tacticians. One of the most effective is Liberal Senator Cory Bernardi, Tony Abbott's parliamentary secretary. What's your name? Cory. Cory Bernardi. Staunchly conservative in his political views, Bernardi honed his organising skills with US Republican activists to counter what he saw as the left-wing influence, especially among young Australians. Well, there's a lot of people here that have different motivations, but That's in right. the end they feel betrayed by this government. And they do. They do exactly right. And, by and there's no better place to learn than to go to America about these things. And I went there and I, I met with a number of key players in the activism training schools and how they went about their business and what their objectives were. And I thought, well, you know, it's going to be a very modest contribution here, but I can try and learn from that. My name's Corey Bernardi. I'm a Liberal Senator from South Australia. No need to be alarmed. Liberal means conservative where I'm from. Um, I've been in Bernardi's take-home message from his American training was simple. To build a popular movement, he needed to support a very broad range of conservative activists and their causes. I've always sought to build a movement, not an empire. I want as many you know, like-minded groups out there advocating for what they think is important, not what Corey Bernardi thinks is important. If they've got a good idea about a blog or, you know, an activism uh, initiative that they want to pursue, uh, if I've got the money and the resources to help them, I will do that. Now, I don't necessarily have to agree with everything they do or everything they say. I just want people to get out there and have a go. In the battle against the carbon tax, Bernardi and his colleagues in the conservative blogosphere have come into their own. Beating the Drum is a website supported by Senator Bernardi called Menzies House. It links up scores of sites, bloggers and activists savaging the Gillard government 
the Greens and the Independents over the carbon tax. Many also attack climate science and scientists, including the CSIRO, and promote climate scepticism. I provided them with the infrastructure, the web hosting and the domain name, and they've run with it ever since. I'm happy that it's a successful blog. And they've taken it upon themselves, the administrators of that, to get involved in this carbon tax campaign. And so I think that's a great thing. Many sites also carry a link to what they call the big lie. Uh, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. No Julia Gillard broke her promise as a result of a deal to form minority government with the Greens, and it's her opponent's most powerful weapon. How do you avoid the charge that it's just pure political opportunism on your part to stay in power with the Greens that you are now doing a carbon price? What I said before the last election is I wanted to work for a community consensus on pricing carbon and talked about mechanisms to do that. But during the election campaign, I talked about my belief in climate change, that it's real, that we have to act, and that the most efficient and effective way of acting is by putting a price on carbon. Now, in this parliament, I do have the opportunity to succeed in getting that price on carbon, in realising the emissions trading scheme, the cap and trade scheme this nation has been talking about since before the 2007 election. So I am determined to do that. In their negotiations with Labor, the Greens made it clear they wanted a price put on greenhouse gas emissions as part of the deal to support Labor in a minority government. Clearly, we made it a central plank of the agreement we signed <laughs> to give the Gillard government confidence uh, that we wanted to establish a multi-party committee uh, with a view to taking strong action on climate change and, in particular, a price on carbon. And we cited that a couple of times in the agreement very clearly that was one of the conditions of a central plank, the very first plank of the agreement on policy. Julia Gillard and her ministers finalised the climate deal with the Greens and the Independents in July. Its aim is to make 500 major companies begin to pay a price for their greenhouse gas pollution. We will require them to pay a price per tonne. Australians have struggled to unite over a climate change policy for well over a decade as the warnings from climate scientists became increasingly urgent. Despite being one of the biggest polluters per head, many still argue cutting our greenhouse emissions will make little difference globally. It's a stand the government insists is no longer sustainable as other nations step up their efforts to deal with climate change. If we turn around and say, as the highest polluter per person, oh, it's nothing to do with us, get lost, we're doing nothing, we're safe down here in Australia, um, you know, how, what credibility is that going to have? We need international cooperation. Australia's got a proud history of working internationally to achieve you know, progressive outcomes. This is an occasion where we should be standing tall and playing a responsible and fair role internationally and not burying our heads in the sand. The scientific evidence is clear that we need to tackle climate change. It takes an international effort to achieve it. Australia's got a responsibility to play its part. Well, I think it's very important to be able to do our bit and it's very important for other nations to be able to do their bit as well. And we have a responsibility and we've got a direct action policy that not only reduces emissions but actually improves other environmental assets. I can see... A lot of people... Tony Abbott and senior Liberals repeatedly maintain they believe in man-made climate change. What they oppose, they say, is forcing businesses to pay a carbon tax to deal with it. There should be no new tax collection without an election. 
that many of those rallying against the carbon tax are deeply sceptical of the science of climate change. And this campaign is giving them a powerful platform. After Tony Abbott leaves the stage at these rallies, the microphone is often handed to sceptics denouncing climate scientists, including CSIRO scientists, for exaggerating the threat from climate change. He's from the Galileo movement. He's here to expose the corruption, the political corruption and the scientific corruption. You've heard him before. He's on the ball and boy does he mean business. Ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm Roberts. The core issue in this whole scam, they're stealing your money and they're stealing your freedom. Carbon dioxide does not drive temperature. Car temperature determines carbon dioxide levels. A complete reversal of what these people are spreading. Their lies and their deceptions. Brown and Gillard. Ask yourself why, as you check www.galileomovement.com.au. This is a scam. Is that a problem for the, for the alternative Prime Minister, to share a platform with people who do believe that scientists in the CSIRO are part of a conspiracy? Look, uh, obviously I can't speak for other people's views. Uh, I can only speak uh, for my own views and for the views of uh, the coalition that I lead. Now, uh, um, the CSIRO obviously has a position. Uh, it's a position that it argues for in good faith and good luck to them. Do you endorse the CSIRO position well, on I, this issue? I, I accept that climate change is real, uh, that humanity makes a contribution and that we should have a strong and effective policy to deal with it. Would they pull out? But Abbott's own parliamentary secretary is a vocal advocate for climate sceptics. I stand with the mainstream of Australia. The mainstream of Australia do not buy the lies and the disingenuous statements that have been peddled by people who seek to profit from this whole climate change hysteria. And that means that's the government. It's a lot of these green groups that have been discredited. It's the paid mouthpieces of the government. What um, about the CSIRO or the Australian Academy of Sciences? Well, th this, is, this is the issue. There are lots of different organisations that will take different positions on this. But what I've found invariably is that those, um, or not invariably, there may be some exceptions, but the majority of those that advocate the catastrophic, you know, anthropogenic climate change position are funded by governments. I would urge politicians too to look at all the evidence and to um, wonder why it might be that something like 32 national academies of science all around the world are all saying that it's very likely that human activity has adversely affected our climate through global warming. Why would they do that if it were not true? Australia's chief scientist is worried the debate over climate science has become too divisive. I think it's uh, as bad now as I've ever known any debate on any important or contentious issue. And I understand that people will have different views about these things. I think it's important that people do have different views about these things. When you see what's actually happening and how people are being described and the correspondence they get when they make a statement that somebody just happens not to like, um, then I think uh, things have reached a new low. Climate scientists are increasingly concerned by the number of anonymous, abusive and threatening emails sent to them. Among the targets is Professor Will Steffen, who sits on the government's Climate Commission. Certainly I'm concerned about the threats. Um, I had, I've had a few myself. Some of my colleagues have had even more than I've had. Uh, and uh, it is fairly widespread in the scientific community. Are these threats of violence or...? A few of them are, are threats of violence. A very few of them are very direct threats of violence to the point where they have to be taken seriously, for example, by university security or by the AFP or somebody like that. Uh, many of them are simply very nasty emails with veiled threats in them that what might happen to us in, in a very general way. We think in Germany right now it's possible to protect the climate 
to contribute to climate protection. Prominent German scientist Professor John Schellenhuber was targeted by a radical fringe group at a climate conference in Melbourne in July. Shocked Australian scientists looked on as the professor was accosted by a demonstrator dangling a noose in front of him. He was really quite shaken by this, and after having gone back to Germany, I, I know that what he's telling his colleagues is you wouldn't believe the atmosphere in Australia around the climate change issue. He described it as probably the most toxic in the planet. I don't know whether he's been to the USA lately. It's, it's pretty bad over there, too. But there's no doubt that we in the United States stand out around the world uh, in the scientific community in terms of the abuse uh, of science and the, um, the sort of toxic atmosphere that's been created what can you, if anything, do to prevent these scientists from being driven out of the public debate because of these kind of death threats? Well, I can use the power of this office and my advocacy uh, to call for respect for scientists and for a legitimate discussion about their views. I mean, the problem here is that people have decided to attack the scientists themselves uh, as Prime Minister, I consistently say to the nation, we've always got to treat our scientists with respect, accept what they say about the science. The public policy debate can then happen, uh, but it shouldn't be a public policy debate that turns on the scientists. And I think to the extent that that has happened during this debate, it is a very repugnant trend in our national conversation. What do you think of the quality of the debate on climate change in Australia at the moment? I think uh, it's very poor. I think every time I think it's reached a low, we then go on and reach a new low. And uh, I think that's uh, a very little benefit to us as we're trying to grapple with what is a very serious problem that needs serious discussion. The Prime Minister bluntly blames the opposition leader for this change in the scientific debate. I think it's gone down because uh, Tony Abbott and opposition figures have been prepared to abuse scientists. I think that's what's taken the debate down. Is she right? No, uh, she's quite wrong. I mean, look, what we've got is uh, a relentless negativity from the Prime Minister and Greg Combe. Uh, and if they want to talk about uh, demonstrations and the Americanisation of Australian public life, uh, the only violent demonstration that I can remember outside of Parliament House was organised by Greg Combe and addressed by Kim Beasley, uh, and it involved hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage and injuries to people. How are you, mate? Didn't take long. No. Gillard's climate change minister, Greg Combe, is a former trade union official who helped run the bitter waterfront dispute against the Howard government. Um, well, this afternoon we've got a briefing for caucus, so I just wanted to take you through. But he strongly rejects opposition claims he was responsible for any violent demonstration. But Combe is a seasoned political fighter and he's determined to stare down any challenge to the carbon policy. You also, as I understand it, have had death threats over mm. this issue. Has that affected you personally? Does it undermine how you do your job? Oh, one of the unfortunate things about being in public life for a long time, as I have been, uh, so including my period as a trade unionist and leader of the trade union movement, is and, and going through many of the things like the waterfront dispute that I did, unfortunately, my, myself and my family have been exposed to this sort of rubbish before, so um, I suppose I'm a bit inoculated to it, but yeah, there's been a lot of uh, that kind of uh, commentary and threat going on. Combe is determined to get Australia's first carbon pricing scheme through Parliament by the end of the year, but he's battling fears about its impact on ordinary Australians. Uh, this is Rita, the store owner Rita, of the Sun Joe. Good to see you. How are you? Oh, Hi, Joe. Joe. Tony Abbott. Good to see you. How are you? Good. Abbott has been targeting small businesses like this across the country, warning of rising electricity prices and job losses. 
because the thing about the carbon tax is that the carbon tax is going to put about a 25% uh, hit on your electricity bills, which would that be $1,500. Abbott's campaign is backed by some of Australia's biggest businesses who are funding advertisements to drive home the message. <laughs> what does the world's biggest carbon tax mean to our family? It means our electricity bill goes up by hundreds in the first year alone. It means the cost of groceries, food, public transport, childcare, practically everything we need and use will go up. We're far from wealthy, but we're not getting a cent in compensation. Warnings that electricity prices will rise do hit home mainly because households and businesses across the country have seen their power bills go up between 20 and 30 per cent in the last three years. But this had nothing to do with the carbon price, according to the independent experts. The increase in electricity prices we've seen over the last few years is clearly not because of the carbon price, because that's not there yet. The so what is causing it? The major cause for the increase in electricity prices is uh, network infrastructure expenditure. And in simple terms for the average consumer, what is that? It's uh, investing in poles and wires and the substations in uh, the network that delivers our electricity from the power stations where it's generated uh, to your front door or to your office or business. How big is this upgrade and what sort of money are we talking about? It's extraordinarily large. Uh, over the current five-year period, it's in excess of $45 billion. The impact of the carbon price on power bills is expected to be a relatively modest 10% rise, significantly less than the recent slugs on electricity users. And many households will be compensated. But the fear generated by the anti-carbon tax campaign is overwhelming the government's arguments. Well, let's just come back again and look at some of the facts. The cost of living impact of a reform of this nature is in fact quite modest. It's a 0.7% increase in the CPI, less than $10 a week averaged across all Australian households, and the government's providing tax cuts and increases in the pension and other benefits that average in benefit across Australian households of slightly more than $10 a week. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big welcome to Sophie Mirabella. My friends, why should we close factories across the country? Why should we export our jobs and our industry and our innovation? The opposition's warning that the carbon tax will cause huge job losses are arguably the most nerve-wracking for the government. They're aimed directly at Labor's blue-collar voters, already suspicious about Gillard's deal with the Greens. Ladies and gentlemen, from all corners of Australia, maintain the rage, maintain the fight. Do not let them silence your voice because I still want to live in a country where people matter. This is our country. But drowned out in the noise is the fact that many businesses that face overseas competition will get generous amounts of free permits to help cover their carbon costs. The whole hype that Tony Abbott has created about, in his terms, unimaginable you know, cost impacts, of course, is completely deceitful and untrue. The concern he's generated about job security is also completely unfounded and untrue. He has said that the entire coal industry will be destroyed. That's what he said. He's forecast that entire towns and regions are going to be wiped off the map, that the manufacturing industry will die. I mean, this is the most absurd, hyperventilating tripe that I can remember in public life. Again, Marion, if they are determined to have the parliament deal with the carbon tax, uh, they should have an election and they should have it now. Now, um, I think it's fundamentally dishonest of a political party um, to try to ram something as important as this through the parliament uh, without a mandate, and clearly they don't have a mandate. So, so I think the government 
should go to an election, and I think it should be now. The big picture in the fight over the carbon policy is largely overlooked. But if you come to the heart of Queensland's coal country, the Bowen Basin, it gets a bit clearer. Australia's dependence on fossil fuel exports, especially coal, is huge, and it's about to get a whole lot bigger. Our customers will have to account for their greenhouse emissions when this coal is burned overseas. But getting the coal out of the ground is releasing more and more greenhouse gases here. Under the carbon policy, the big mining companies will be forced to pay a price for these emissions. They will also get some assistance from the government, but not as much as some other industries. What's this mine we can see over here, all along the side of the road? Well, we've seen the sort of the signs and the entrances to about 11 or 12 mines, and then of course Copper Bella um, is the big open cut mine that you can see from the highway. Um, so that's, yes, 11 or 12 mines in the 30 kilometres since we left Moorumbah. And who owns... Kirsten Livermore is certainly hearing the loud cries from the mining companies that the carbon price will kill jobs in the coal industry. She's the federal Labor MP for this area, indeed the Gillard government's last regional member in Queensland. But she doesn't believe the carbon price will see the coal industry shedding jobs here. In the Bowen Basin, uh, you just cannot believe um, those sorts of predictions uh, because you can see with your own eyes what is happening. These companies are not investing in ports and railway lines and new mines uh, and new accommodation camps uh, if they think it's all going to finish, you know, next year or the year after or in five years' time. But when Tony Abbott visited the Bowen Basin coal mines recently, he told a very different story. Uh, we are here in the electorate of Capricornia, uh, represented by Kirsten Livermore of the Labor Party. It's very disappointing that not once in the last five months have we heard Kirsten Livermore speaking up for the jobs in the Bowen Basin that will be put at risk by Labor's carbon tax. If you listen to the coal companies and their lobbyists, the carbon tax will be a huge blow to the industry. Media headlines have screamed out that 4,000 jobs will be lost, over 1,000 of them in Queensland. But up here in the Bowen Basin, it's hard to fathom the doom and gloom. To the contrary, it's boom, boom, boom. Whether it's companies like BHP that operate this big mine behind me or the other key players, the plans to expand the coal industry are on a staggering scale. Well, the scale of the boom is, unless you see it, is very hard to explain to people that, that uh, the size of this expansion that's going on here. You know, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, millions and millions of tonne of coal being uh, mined and exported over the next, well, forever. What sort of money are we talking about being invested in this region? Oh, billions, billions of dollars. You know, the, the Hancock Railway line loans about over $2 billion. Cedric, what does this map actually show us? This map shows us the Isaac Regional Council. As local mayor for this region, Cedric Marshall's problem is not mines shutting down, but mines expanding on an unprecedented scale. We've got 26 operating mines out of the 43 in the Bowen Basin. Even if 60 or 70 per cent of this uh, proposed expansion goes ahead, we're going to need thousands of, of uh, employees for that mining industry. And, uh, yeah, I don't know where they're going to come from. It's going to be a challenge. I know uh, all businesses except the mining industry are having uh, challenges uh, attracting employees because of the remuneration packages within the mining industry. So Up here, the concerns about the carbon policy are not high on the mayor's agenda. 
I know it's, it will affect the tourism industry, but uh, from all uh, feedback we've had so far, uh, there's not a great deal effect on this black coal industry here in, in the Bowen Basin. But that's all to be seen if it happens to come in. The coal industry stands by its warnings there will be big job losses from the carbon policy. We're saying that there will be a reduction of one third in the growth of the industry longer term. And we're saying that there will be uh, a closure potentially of 25 mines in the first four years of the introduction of this tax. And how many mines will open and what will the growth be in that same period? Well, obviously, if we're reducing growth by one third, there is uh, a two thirds growth. Uh, there is an investment pipeline, uh, as you've rightly pointed out, as the Minister has pointed out, uh, and that's very important for the economy. You know, claims of massive job losses are completely absurd. The coal industry has at least $70 billion worth of investment coming into it that's committed, uh, 19 new mines opening up uh, that are committed. You know, the average carbon price cost per tonne of coal mined once the carbon price legislation comes into place is only $1.90 per tonne of coal in the first year, $1.90 as against a coke and coal export price currently in excess of $300 a tonne. I mean, the, it's, it's a modest... Uh, impost on the industry and it will create an incentive to reduce their methane emissions and that's a positive thing. Ironically, these assurances that the huge expansion of the coal industry will continue bolsters the opponent's most effective argument. The putting a price on carbon emissions in Australia, while India, Japan and China keep burning coal, just delivers pain with no environmental gain. The message that the government's policy will do nothing to combat dangerous climate change globally is being pushed heavily by the coal industry. Australia's carbon tax won't cut global coal emissions. It will just cut Queensland jobs. Everyone says, this is ineffectual. It's, the analogy is uh, you're standing in the, in the road and the big bus is bearing down on you. Unless you're Superman, you can't make one single leap and get out of the way. You have to start running. And you start running by taking a step. If people said that step is ineffectual because you'll still get hit by the bus. Well, they're wrong. You have to start. And I, th I think the sort of thing we're debating now is a credible package to get us started on the way. We love CO2, don't we? Uh, we do. CO2 keeps us all alive. Do you know what percentage of CO2 there is in the atmosphere? How much? In the whole of the atmosphere we breathe. 0.04 of a percent. 0.04 of a percent. The convoy of no confidence. I must say I want to... The protests against the carbon policy show no sign of stopping. Just a few weeks ago, scores of truckers descended on Canberra in a convoy of no confidence against the government. There weren't that many, but they were loud. And urging them on, as always, was the king of talkback radio, Alan Jones. Go away, Julia. Get out of our lives, Julia. Is that what we're saying? This is the kind, Jones this is, is openly kind. backing Tony Abbott's bid for power. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome the voice for the voiceless, the alternative Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. Jones has also helped to set the deeply divisive tone of this political battle. Ladies and gentlemen. Including the personal abuse of the Prime Minister. And some believe it has pushed the boundaries of media coverage over the line. Deal about the future of our country. It is absolutely laughable. The woman's off her tree. And quite frankly, they should shove her and Bob Brown in a chaff bag and take them as far out to sea as they can and tell them to swim home. The statements by Mr Jones are completely unacceptable, uh, should never have been made and should certainly not be repeated. Of course, Mr Jones is actively campaigning against the government and for the election of a Liberal government. 
Look, uh, that's not the kind of language that we uh, uh, that I think we should have. Uh, I make it very clear. Uh, Alan is a friend of mine. Uh, I think Alan uh, does a terrific job uh, when it comes to public advocacy, but he would be the first to admit that sometimes uh, he goes a little too far. All of us, uh, in the heat of debate, have a tendency uh, to go too far. <laughs> But against all odds, those who are backing the plan to put a price on greenhouse gases are on the road to success. Thanks, everyone. Well, first of all, congratulations to everyone who's turned up here today because this is really a statement about the future. If ever there was a contrast... With the help of the Greens, along with the independents, Labor could well have the first national law to price greenhouse gas emissions through the parliament by the end of the year. Absolutely. It will be through by the end of this year and it will come into effect on the 1st of July next year. So we are going to see Australia actually seriously uh, acting on climate change getting the price on pollution and seeing all those advantages start to flow with major investment in renewable energy. And the only thing that'll hold it up is the filibuster that the coalition engages in. But for every day that they filibuster, there is another sitting day and we will persist and persist until it gets through. Big day, Prime Minister. It certainly is. Gillard and her climate change minister last week brought the historic bill to price carbon emissions into the parliament. Prime Minister. And with the parliament deeply divided, she threw down the gauntlet to the opposition. The final test is not, are you on the right side of the politics of this week or the polls of this year? The final test is, are you on the right side of history? Yeah, yeah. And in my experience, the judgment of history has a way of speaking sooner than we would expect. But history is yet to judge whether Julia Gillard's prime ministership will survive this test. And I'm representing my four grandchildren. And I thank you very much for doing this. Oh, thank you. That's lovely. Great photo. While her ardent supporters were here in force on the historic day, out in the broader community, Labor's primary vote has sunk to unprecedented lows. And some in her own party want to bring back Kevin Rudd to replace her. Thank you very much. Are you confident that you will survive in the next year to take the Labor Party to the next election? Yes. You're confident your colleagues will still stick with you if your primary vote is in the 20s? Uh, my view is Labor Party people come into Parliament, as I did in 1998, wanting to make a difference. You join the Labor Party because you believe in something. You strive for government in order to realise that vision of opportunity and fairness, of not leaving anyone behind. You look to a leader who can implement that vision for you. I am that leader and on that basis I believe I will enjoy my colleagues' support. <laughs> I will do my best against whatever la uh, leader the Labor Party has, Marion. Um, if it's Kevin Rudd, well, <laughs> um, so be it. If it's Julia Gillard, uh, so be it. But uh, last time I was up against Kevin Rudd, the Labor Party removed him. So this is not just about a carbon tax, which is likely to pass into law, but about political brinkmanship and who is going to lead this country. Next week on Four Corners with the Catholic Church in Adelaide at the centre of a new controversy over its handling of claims of alleged sexual abuse, we examine a truly shocking case, the abuse of disabled children attending a Catholic school. Why were the parents left in the dark for a decade? Until then, good night.